Welcome once again to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. This month's webinar is going to be on targeting common brush species, presented by Dr. Megan Clayton. Dr. Clayton works with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. This webinar is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Megan, with that, I'll pass the controls over to you, and you should be good to go. Great, thanks so much, Clint, and thanks to all of you for being here today. So today I want to cover just a little bit about brush management, and also we'll touch on weed management. Um, and then at the end, I'm planning to leave plenty of time, so if you have any questions specific to your property or species uh, that you may be dealing with that are noxious, uh, we could definitely address those. Um, I am with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. I'm a range specialist down in South Texas based out of Corpus Christi, and I cover most counties in South Texas and along the coastal bend. First, I want to start out with why do we even have brush? So it seems like we spend a lot of time thinking about um, how to either manipulate brush into moths or patterns that we want. Uh, but I'd like to stop for just a minute and think about why we have so much brush in the first place. So one thing you could argue is that long-term changes in climate have created these severe droughts like we just experienced started um, in 2011. Of course, right now we're getting tons of rain. Um, if you're in a part of the area of the state that's been uh, blessed with all this flooding, um, it's hard to remember back to 2011, but for sure when we have severe droughts, we create more bare ground, and it leaves more opportunity for those seeds to germinate. Also, you're going to notice that species such as honey mesquite, they're going to put on more beans during drought as sort of a life strategy, um, so they actually might exasperate the problem uh, during those years. But I would argue that it's more our human influence or things that we've done to create this uh, brush density issue that we have today, and namely I would point towards improper grazing. So back in the day, if you think when we had much more grasslands in Texas, um, we did have many of these species like a honey mesquite and weesatch, but they weren't in the densities that we see today. We had wild buffalo that roamed, and once we colonized, um, we started putting up fences and keeping our livestock within our properties, and pretty soon we had an issue of overgrazing. Also, the role of fire. Of course, once we come in and we develop our barns and our houses and our fences, we really don't want them to burn down. And so, of course, um, those, that fire helped to maintain some of the brush uh, issue, but we're going to suppress those natural fires um, in order to save all of our development. So those natural fires, of course, mostly were started through lightning strikes, but also there's some evidence that Indians did set the fires. Um, so there is some history of that maintaining our grasslands. We'll talk a little bit about why prescribed burning today doesn't necessarily um, create a solution for our brush issues. And then finally, of course, when we come in, uh, we're going to change the land use. We're going to develop different portions. And then, of course, with improved transportation, we have actually brought in some species that have made life a bit more difficult for us because they are, tend to be more invasive than some of our native species. Um, also, there are elevations in atmospheric CO2, which tends to lean towards um, the growth of brush species versus grass species. And so in that way, there could be some influence that we're having on the environment. But more importantly, I would lean towards improper grazing and the role of fire for the reason that we have more brush. So here's a look at uh, the historic fire trends map that was created by Keith Blair. And you can see the top number is fire frequency, or how often a single plot of land would burn. And the bottom number is the acres that burned annually. So you can see that fire, historically, was a very important tool that was used to maintain our lands as we used to know them. So before we get started into how to control brush, I want to talk about how to make sure that you're dealing with the species that you think you're dealing with. There's a number of really, really great plant ID tools uh, that can help you get a name for that plant. 
One is the Rangeland Plants of Texas database, which is uh, created through my Ecosystem Science and Management Extension Department. And if you go to the little Help Me Identify My Plant blue tab and click on that, it's going to take you to a list of a number of different characteristics about a plant. And when you select different things, it's going to help you narrow down which plant it is. I think we have over 400 plants that are most common or we get most questions about in this system, uh, but knowing whether or not it has a bean pod or thorns or its leaf shape can really help you narrow down which plant that is um, and help you get an answer pretty quickly. What I really like about this site is that each individual page not only gives a little description about the plant um, and where you could typically find that plant growing, but it gives you pictures of the plant in different circumstances. So you're going to see it out in the field, up close, uh, different plant parts that might help you with ID. Um, it doesn't just give you one single uh, picture that you try to match with your plant you have in hand. Another good resource is the USDA NRCS Plants Database. Um, this one you're going to go just sort of the same way into their search box and either search by scientific name or common name. Um, you do have to be careful, though, because this is for the entire nation. And so you'll always want to make sure that your plant that you look up uh, is, in fact, in Texas. So it will give you a little map, range map, and just make sure that Texas is, in fact, highlighted after you find what you believe is your plant, um, such as the silverleaf nightshade that's in the example. So they sort of have the same thing, a number of characteristics that you could select that will help to narrow down that plant. And one of those is by picking your state. So that could help you out a lot when trying to narrow down such a huge database, because they certainly have a lot of plants in there. Another one, if you have an iPhone or a tablet, or I guess I should say an Android or a tablet, um, is the BRIT Texas Plants um, Database. And this comes out from the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. And it has pretty much every plant that you would see on that Texas Rangeland Plants Database in it. Um, in addition, it also has a little ID quiz. If you're a, a plant nerd like me, then you might want to, when you have downtime, pull that up. It'll give you a little picture of a plant and then four choices. So it kind of helps you learn some of your more common plants. Just like in that database that we saw, it's going to give you a picture of the plant and a little bit of a description. Um, this, unfortunately, right now is only available for Android phones. Um, I have contacted the uh, group, and they said that they used to have it for iPhone, and they will hopefully have it for iPhone again. So if you're an Apple product user, um, beware that this may become available soon. Another thing that they're going to work on that kind of drives me crazy is each of those pictures, um, you cannot actually zoom in with your fingers to see an up-close view of the leaves, and they said they're going to try to fix that feature as well because they've had that feedback from several people. Has anyone used LeafSnap? LeafSnap is a really cool tool for identifying trees, so it's only good for trees. Um, I really wish they had one for forbs and grasses, but I guess that'd be a lot more difficult to develop. Um, leaf snap is pretty simple. When you find a tree that you're not sure what it is, you'll get one single leaf and put it on a white background. So I usually use the back of a white sheet of paper. You'll take a picture of that leaf with your phone, and that leaf shape is actually going to help you narrow down which tree that could be. So it uses the shape of the leaf to give you a list of trees that are possible, and then from that, you're probably Probably going to recognize some of the names of things that grow in your area, or else you can click on each one and it'll give you more information about where you might find it and what the rest of the tree might look like as far as maybe tree shape. Another resource that some of our county extension agents use is ID Weeds. I don't care for it as much because it is a nationwide resource. You have to be careful that you're looking at a plant that actually grows in Texas. Um, but they do have a lot of weed species on there, and so if weeds are your issue, uh, you might want to check out ID Weeds as an app for your phone or tablet. A uh, relatively new one from Dow AgroSciences is a solution finder, and they have some pretty nice weed um, pictures for things that are fairly common in fields. And the nice thing is you could select multiple weeds that are growing in a pasture, and it'll kind of narrow down what chemicals may help you um, to take care of all of those weeds at once. So that's kind of a unique tool to have. And then, of course, if you click on one of the 
products. It's going to give you more information about that label. And even a tank mix calculator built in. So I would suggest figuring out what rate it says on the label, figuring out how much you would have to purchase and what that's going to cost you, and maybe trying another chemical and seeing how much that would cost, just so you can kind of price compare before you end up in the store to purchase your product. And of course, there's traditional plant ID books available. Um, available on the Extension Bookstore is a number of plants. If you have livestock and you're concerned about toxic plants, the Toxic Plants of Texas book is really a great one. It not only helps you with ID, but it also tells you different characteristics that the livestock might exhibit if they have eaten this plant. Um, the Brush and Weeds of Texas is a really good general weed and brush uh, book. It has very nice colored pictures. And then Texas Range Plants and Know Your Grasses are some other options that might be helpful for you, uh, depending on what part of the state you're in. If you need a specific recommendation as far as brush or weeds or grass, um, if you'll just let me know, um, maybe in an email, I'll give it to you at the end of the, the presentation. What you're looking for, I can help you out with a great book that would be a good resource. So finally, if we know what brush or weed issue we're talking about, how do we know what management option would be best for our situation? So basically, we have four main tools in our toolbox that can help us to control noxious brush issues. One's going to be prescribed fire. Another is chemical management using herbicides. Another might be mechanical management. And finally, biological control. So biological control in the picture, we have goats. But it could actually be using livestock like uh, cattle in order to utilize some of the grass that maybe our wildlife's not utilizing and really even benefit the land for wildlife by using them as a tool. That's also where maybe an insect that's released to take care or uh, push back a certain plant species, that would fall under biological control. Mechanical options are great. We have a number of things that we can do both individually and on a broadcast level for brush species. Um, on an individual level, it's fairly common to see people grubbing out species. Um, you can be very selective with a grubbing tool, uh, but it is very time consuming and expensive. And you have to kind of think about, too, anytime you do a mechanical um, management, you're going to be moving some of that soil. And so that soil disturbance is something to think about, um, what you're going to leave your pastures in and what's going to happen to your topsoil if you're taking out a lot of plants. On a broadcast level, we often see people doing things like root plowing. And I'm very hesitant to suggest doing a root plow depending on the situation because all of your free seed, your free native seed, is in your topsoil. And so if you take that root plow down, you're oftentimes turning over your topsoil. And even if you do root plowing through like an NRCS contract, they're going to require you to replant that property because you've turned over your topsoil. So um, knowing what situations that might be right in, uh, before you actually um, put that blade in the ground will be very important. Now, if you have a piece of property that is totally invaded by brush, and previous to that it had been farmed for many years, that might be a situation where there's probably not a lot of seed bank left, and you might be OK with going ahead and root plowing that property and then reseeding to whatever you're hoping to have there. For chemical management, um, a lot of times in the wildlife world, we hadn't really considered herbicide as one of our tools because it kind of gets a negative environmental profile. But in fact, if you apply herbicides in the correct way, it can be a very important tool, especially in Texas, given that most of our species are re-sprouters. And we're going to look at what that means to be a brush plant that's a re-sprouter and why it makes it more difficult. Uh, basically, anytime you kill or remove just the top part of that plant, it's going to come back from several buds. And so using a chemical method may actually kill that plant down to the root system and allow that soil to not be disturbed. So in some situations, chemicals are going to be a really good option. And we're going to rely heavily in this presentation on looking at different herbicide techniques that you could perform for brush management. Finally, fire. What about prescribed fire? If that's how our land evolved, having regular fires on our landscape, why can't we just apply prescribed burning to our land and take care of this brush issue? Well, mainly it's because 
um, those plants that are re-sprouters, once you burn them, oftentimes their growing point has already dropped below the soil surface. So think about a really hot fire going across the landscape, but um, down 14 inches or even a few inches below that soil surface, it's not getting hot enough to actually kill that bud zone. And so what you're doing is either uh, top removing that plant or top killing that plant, or if it's a larger tree, you may just be pruning it up, which might make a nice shade tree. So is fire uh, worthless as far as brush management? Not necessarily. It can do a lot of things for our property. It can actually uh, knock brush back so that it comes back from the base. And maybe our wildlife, such as white-tailed deer, could actually utilize those leaves better because they're at a lower stature. Um, so fire is a really great tool. It's just not one that's going to kill a high percentage of our brush and our pasture if that is our goal. So here's a picture of that re-sprouting um, stem that I keep talking about. So if you picture the soil surface at the top of the picture, all of those little wart-like looking structures are actually buds. And in this bud zone, that's why when you remove the top, it often comes back from several buds. So when a tree is a seedling, how many stems does it have? One, right? It has one stem. And then once you remove the top, all of a sudden you've got a tree that you're not really sure if it's one tree or two trees or several trees. And that's because it's come back from several of those buds that were released when the top was removed or killed. And so you have a multi-stem tree that's smaller on the top part of the soil, but underneath that soil surface, that root system is just as big as the original tree. And so you're kind of compounding your problem. So a lot of times people tell me that they shred their fields for brush control. And really what they're doing is making their brush very angry. And so it just keeps coming back from those buds, and they keep mowing it over. And so the top part of that plant has more and more stems, and it's smaller, but the root system has continued to grow year after year after year. And so we're talking about a large root system that we're trying to control with only a small part of a tree up top, which makes it very difficult. So one thing you could do to take care of some brush species is do individual plant treatments. And I really like individual plant treatments, or IPT, because it's easy to do, and you can really target specific species or even specific trees in your pasture. Um, so when you do a leaf spray, you're actually applying this chemical mix to all of the leaves until they're wet but not dripping on that plant. And what's going to happen is you're applying it at a certain time so that that plant is storing its carbohydrates in the root system. So remember back in sixth grade when we had photosynthesis? So when photosynthesis happens, that light is hitting that green leaf and it's creating carbohydrates or sugars. And that plant wants to store those carbohydrates or sugars in the root system. And so when it goes down there, it's tagging this chemical along with it, and it's killing that bud zone that we looked at earlier in that picture. So the timing of your spray is very important. And we'll talk about timing because it's going to vary depending on which brush species we're talking about. Most often when I spray, of course, in our previous picture, it was a little rig that was done um, on a four-wheeler, or you could do that on a mule or a golf cart type thing. Um, but I often use just a backpack sprayer, or you could even use a simple pump-up sprayer from the store. Um, I use solo backpack sprayers just because they've worked well for me. They actually come with two different types of pumps, a piston pump and a diaphragm pump. And I prefer piston pumps because they tend to leak less often. Um, also, you'll see that harness sits on that backpack sprayer. And if you've ever sprayed with a backpack for more than one day in a row, you'll notice that your shoulders get extremely um, um, sore. When you buy the backpack sprayer, it comes with, quote, padded straps. But those padded straps don't stay padded for too long. And this little harness here, it's an aftermarket. I think it's about $40 from places like forestry suppliers. It actually puts the weight on your hips instead of your shoulders. So spraying continuously will be a little bit more comfortable. What's really important about this setup is the nozzle. So you want to make sure that you have the right nozzle for the job. And for doing a leaf spray, we suggest a cone jet X8 nozzle. So the higher the number, the bigger the hole. 
And the reason we want a big hole when we're spraying for leaves is because we want that pattern to go out in a wide area so that we're covering those leaves completely, hitting all of them and not missing any. Because, you know, if we miss just one twig, there's likely a bud zone below that twig and that plant will regrow. So it's important to cover the, that plant completely and using the right nozzle we found actually helps with the job. Um, also, always use a mesh screen or a check valve. So these little screens are very cheap. Um, for a couple of bucks, you can get a package of them. You'll put that in right behind your nozzle. And it does two things. One, it's going to keep your nozzle from dripping when you let go of the handle, so the whole deal is a little bit cleaner. Um, and also, it's going to keep your nozzle from getting clogged up. So if you're out in the field and it does get clogged, you can simply take out your mesh screen and tap it a little bit, and typically it'll start working again. So a really valuable thing. You'll notice if you buy a solo backpack sprayer and you don't replace the entire handle, um, your Conejet X8 may not fit on there just perfectly, but I found if you just put a little O-ring in there in the nozzle, it'll help to seal that on the end of the spray wand um, so it'll work really well. Finally, what chemical mix are we talking about spraying? So what chemical you actually use is going to depend on what species you're spraying. And so we can get more into exact species and what chemicals a little bit later. But when you do IPT, we're talking in percent. So you'll usually be told to put out 1% mix or 2% mix. And that's 1% of your entire gallon or 2 gallons or 3 gallons, however much you're mixing up. Uh, you always dilute in water when you're putting this mixture on leaves. Um, I've been told before, well, I put a little bit of diesel in my mix because it helps the plant defoliate faster. Well, I would say if you're putting an investment into your um, into putting chemical on your plants, then you're not going to want that to defoliate faster. You're going to want that chemical to sit on that leaf for as long as possible. So don't put diesel in the mix. Just use water anytime you're doing a leaf spray. That goes for weeds or anything else. Um, also, when you do a leaf spray, you always want to put in a surfactant. And sometimes people tell me they like to use dish detergent, which is fine. But we say to use dish detergent as a last resort because it may foam a lot. And also, we can't guarantee what other ingredients are in that dish detergent and how that's going to react with your chemical. What we suggest is just buying a simple non-ionic generic surfactant wherever you purchase your chemicals from. You only put in a quarter of 1%. So it's not very much. You're not going to use very much when you're doing this work. Um, but it's extremely important. If you look at that picture over on the right-hand side of the two leaves, the one on the top does not have a surfactant in the mix, and the one on the bottom does. So surfactant is just cutting that surface tension so that your chemical mix can get in contact with that leaf and be absorbed better. Um, so very important in any um, leaf spray mix. Also, when we do IPT, we suggest using a blue dye at just a quarter to half of a percent. Um, I kind of just put it in there until it looks blue enough that I can see it on the leaves. Um, the blue dye will help you mark where you've sprayed that chemical. Make sure that you just get it on the plant you want it on and that you've covered that plant in entirety. Uh, really important. And I bet I could take a poll, and if you've used uh, blue dye before, you know what a mess it can be. Uh, but remember, if you get blue dye somewhere, it's got chemical with it, too. So it's a really good marker. Um, also, blue dye will not come out of straw cowboy hats or boots, but it will come out of your clothes and off of your skin. So um, it's not too bad of a thing, and it's a really good thing to add in so that you don't use more chemical mix than you actually need. Another thing you could do uh, as opposed to spraying a leaf spray is to spray a stem spray. Um, this is a great technique. I really promote this for these small, smooth stems um, on seedling trees that have come up. All you're going to have to do is spray your mix about 12 inches high all the way around the stem down to the ground. But there's no need to let this pull up on the ground. This is kind of a ridiculous picture because the nozzle there is used for a weed spray or a fan nozzle. Um, but you definitely want to make sure you have the right nozzle so you're simply directing that mixture right onto that stem um, so that you don't use too much chemical or get chemical where you don't intend. 
there is a, a nozzle that we recommend. It's still a cone jet, but instead of an X8, like we said, for the um, leaf spray, we suggest an X1 or an X2 if you're impatient like I am. Um, and that's a much smaller hole, so it's going to put out more of a stream onto your stem, and it's going to help get that stem totally covered. Um, again, use a check valve, especially since in this mixture we're going to be using diesel. We suggest only doing a stem spray if you have three or less stems, and that's because you're hedging your bet that you're going to get a good kill. So you know when you've walked up to a tree that's multi-stemmed and you're, it's really hard to tell if it's one or two or three or four trees? Um, they do join up underneath the ground somewhere. So if the soil was at the top part of that picture, um, there underneath, I call that the saddle, where they actually join. And you could do a perfect stem spray, and you just can't get that area that's in that saddle underneath the soil surface. And if there's a bud, like what's circled there in red, um, that bud will re-sprout, and so that plant will still be alive. And so your effort's a little bit for naught. So to, to make it a little bit easier, we say just don't even bother doing a stem spray if you've got more than three stems. When you do a stem spray, it's a really simple mixture. It's using triclopyr, which is commonly known as Remedy Ultra as a trade name, but there are generics of triclopyr available. Um, you're going to use that with diesel. So if you've got those really small, smooth, sparked skin um, or bark, you're going to actually do just a 15% triclopyr, 85% diesel mix. If you've got a little bit thicker bark or um, a stem diameter that's uh, a bit bigger, you're probably going to want to kick that up to 25% triclopyr and a 75% diesel mix. If you've got a mixture in a pasture, I'd say just go ahead and mix at the 25% triclopyr, 75% diesel mix. That way you cover your basis because when you're walking through there, you want to go ahead and treat everything at the same time. We still suggest blue dye, and that's because you want to make sure that that entire um, stem all the way around, all the way down, gets uh, nice and covered. And again, that's up to 12 inches high. But there's no need to use a surfactant because in this case, the diesel is going to be your carrier. The final method you could do to individually treat plants with an herbicide um, is kind of a mechanical and herbicide combination. It's called the cut stump method. The cut stump method removes the top part of the tree, and so you're just left with a flat, clean cut, and you're going to treat that, that stump that's remaining. Um, so it's a pretty simple method. You have a number of different options for how you want to actually remove that tree, and it's probably going to depend on what resources you have or how big the tree is. In this case, they're using a shear on the front of this little um, mechanical machinery, and it's going to cut that, that thing. And in fact, sometimes they even have them now uh, with a sprayer on the front, so it also can spray for you. If you rinse out and have somebody do this um, or hire someone to do this, make sure you go look at what they're doing. Make sure that that sprayer is mounted high enough that it's covering that entire cut stump surface completely, and that when they cut that tree, they usually have to push it forward and then move back and spray. Make sure they're not kicking a lot of dirt or leaving sawdust on that tree cut stump, because anywhere you have that sawdust or dirt, you're not going to get good contact um, with that chemical to the actual stump, and so it's going to regrow from that side. Um, so do pay attention even if you do hire out. Um, it's great to be knowledgeable about what should be happening out there in the field. In this case, this is what my trees look like when I try to cut them. I cut them, and then, you know, you didn't go quite far enough, and so you end up just pop pushing the tree over, and it leaves this uh, kind of ugly edge up here. Um, so be sure in this situation that um, you're, you're remembering that you need to make a flat cut because oftentimes that chemical mixture, that triclopyr and diesel, is going to run down that side and it may not actually get in the cambium layer, which is what our goal is. And when you've cut off a tree, that cambium layer is that really white ring around the outside right behind the bark. And so the cambium layer is what takes the xylem and phloem up and down the tree, so it's like feeding the tree. And so we want to make sure we get that cambium layer sprayed real good, and then go ahead and fill in the middle of the cut stump, and then spray any of the remaining stem that might still be there. 
So in this case over on the left, this guy has really not done himself any favors because he's got a whole bunch of stumps he has to spray and he left an, a lot of um, stem. So he's going to have to spray the top of each of those and the entire stem. So that's not really ideal. Whereas over on the right hand side, they've made a nice flat clean cut as low to the ground as possible without getting dirt on it. And they're just covering right on the top of that stump. Um, pretty much if you do cut stump uh, correctly, it's pretty much 100% effective. So it's a really great method. It's just a little bit more effort up front because you're actually having to remove that tree. Now when we do a leaf spray or a stem spray, does anyone know how long you have to actually leave the tree? It's actually a full year, a full growing season, if not two. And I call them skeletons. If you've done a good job, you're going to have these dead skeletons out in your field. But that chemical is still working on that tree and maybe still killing that bud zone. So you're going to want to leave that tree for a full year. So that's another advantage of doing a cut stump is that you don't have to look at the tree. You removed it um, and it looks a little bit cleaner because you're not having to look at it for a full year. Um, so that's a little bit about individually um, treating plants. Oh, here's an example of what happens if you don't treat the, the cut stump correctly. It is going to come back as a multi-stem plant that looks like a new plant, but in fact that's actually tied to that huge tree's root system underneath the ground. So um, doing these, um, these techniques properly and carefully so that you can use as little of the chemical mix as possible um, is extremely important. When you do a cut stump treatment, it's just similar to the mixture for um, the stem spray, but you're only going to use a 15% triclopyr, 85% diesel mix, um, and that's because um, you're actually opening up that entire wound on the tree, and so it's really not going to uh, need much chemical to effectively kill that tree so it doesn't come back from the bud zone. All right, and if you're sitting there thinking, that's great, individual plant treatment sounds like a good opportunity for me, but right now I have too much brush that I need to get rid of. So that might be the second step for you. If first you need to get control of a large portion of brush, there's a number of different things that you could consider. One, if you have a boom, which is the top left picture mounted here on this tractor, if you have a boom that you can get up high enough to be at least 18 inches over your tallest target plant, um, then that could work out for you. But remember, if you clip the top of those plants with the boom, they're not going to get good coverage on the top of the leaves, and they will come back. So you might as well not spray if you can't get your boom up high enough. Another option is like over on the right hand side a boomless nozzle. Um, this is my little four-wheeler rig and I can push that um, nozzle contrapment up about to where I can cover a six-foot tree with my four-wheeler and that nozzle that's mounted there on the end is called a boom buster nozzle and it puts an arc out about 20 feet. Um, so very effective for um, getting some of that brush. I only have it mounted on one side, so that works well for maybe cleaning up the edges of um, senderos or along maybe a fence line. Um, but again, anything over six foot tall or even, you know, five eight, I'm not going to get good coverage on. Um, so you want to make sure that you've got that up high enough to be covering the height of the tree that you're interested in covering. If you have higher trees, you're pretty much looking at uh, the option there on the bottom of the screen, either a helicopter or um, a fixed wing to spray your property. Helicopters can get in a little bit more, they're a little bit more maneuverable and so they can avoid some sensitive trees or if you have sensitive areas nearby, uh, they're probably the way to go. If you have large acreage to spray, um, a fixed wing might be a better bet just because it's cheaper because they won't have to land as often um, to re-fuel um, and reload the mix. So um, just pulling numbers out of my hat, if you're going to spray with a fixed wing, irrelevant of the chemical cost, it's probably going to cost just to have the, the fixed wing fly about maybe $7 per acre, whereas in comparison a helicopter might be like 15 So it's going to vary depending on where you are, who you use, but um, for the most part it's a lot cheaper to go with a fixed wing, but there's many advantages to using a helicopter for your spraying. So what about using fire and herbicides together? 
we said that fire alone does not necessarily have a high kill or a high control on brush species, but what if you did the two together? So one option might be to go ahead and spray your brush that you'd like to get rid of. Um, a lot of times taking care of the brush issue, defoliating that brush will immediately start growing you more grass. Um, but I. You can't, uh, you gotta have enough grass to carry a good fire. So if chemicals, what you need to do first, go ahead and spray. And then we're talking about waiting at least one to two years before you can burn because you wanna make sure, remember we said to leave that in the field for one to two years so that, that chemical can keep working on the brush. You don't wanna burn too soon in that brush to re-sprout on you because it hadn't had a chance to actually kill the bud zone yet. So definitely wait a year or two before you apply your fire, but in most cases, if you have really thick brush you're trying to get rid of, you're gonna need a year or two to grow enough forage to have a very nice fire. Uh, but then the fire is gonna take care of those skeletons that I talked about having out in the field and will really clean up your pasture and make it look nice. Alternatively, if you already have enough fuel because maybe you don't have really thick brush or you're just blessed with good uh, soils, you could go ahead and burn and knowing that that burn will likely just reduce the stature or top kill much of that brush, um, you could come back later and apply herbicides but you're usually gonna have to wait one to three years because remember that, that root zone underneath the soil is pretty huge. And so you're gonna have to have enough leaf on top of the ground to actually take in enough chemical to kill the bud zone. And so you'll wanna make sure you've got about a three foot tall tree or taller and um, get good coverage and have that tree actually killed. So wait until you got fully leafed out trees before you actually spray again. Um, but using fire and herbicides is a great way to go. This section I call everyone's a math major, even if you tried to avoid those people. Um, I did not enjoy math, but it turns out math just pops up everywhere you go. Um, I wanted to clarify, when we talk about individual plant treatments, we say a rate based on a percentage, and that's because we just don't know the size and how many trees you might have in an acre. So your recommendation is gonna be like a 1% triclopyr, or like we were talking earlier, a 15 or 25% triclopyr. Whereas on a broadcast level, no matter what, you're gonna put the same amount of chemical mixture over the acre. So picture that in your mind. So in that case, we can tell you how much you're gonna put out per acre, and typically you'll hear that like 32 ounces per acre, or, um, a quart per acre. So it kinda helps you understand when you're talking about IPT, you're gonna hear a different recommendation based on um, versus broadcast. So just as um, a review, Make sure I got it all out here. Um, when we say put out a 1% rate of a chemical for a leaf spray, we're talking 1% of that chemical, only 0.25% of a surfactant, only 0.25 to half of a percent of the blue dye, and the rest will be water. So typically in your, say your backpack sprayer, you'll wanna put a little bit of water, add your chemical, add your surfactant, add your dye, and then fill it up to your one gallon mark or three gallon mark, whatever you're mixing. Um, remember in a gallon, there's 128 ounces. So if you're doing 1%, you'll just move that decimal point over and you'll need 1.28 ounces per gallon. If that's confusing to you, you could do 128 times 1% and then divide it by 100 since it's a percent and that's 1.28 ounces per gallon. Um, alternatively, if you're doing just small amounts, I have a hard time with those big jugs to um, pour a really small amount like 1.2 ounces. Um, and I used a conversion where we know that 29.6 mils is in an ounce and a milliliter is the same as a cc. So if you get like a livestock syringe, you could actually just pull it out of that heavy jug instead of having to uh, try to pour that small amount. So that's a little trick. Um, also, if you have a smartphone or a tablet, there's really great um, uh, tank mix apps, and one I really like is one that was put out by DuPont, and it does both percent for IPT or um, per acre for broadcast spraying. So that's another way you could cheat and not have to do all of this math. 
Um, if you do a lot of spraying, you may want to consult what I call our chemical Bible, basically. And this is our chemical weed and brush control guide for rangelands. And it has every recommendation for every plant that we feel like we have enough data for and has been replicated over enough time and space in order to feel confident putting it in this book. So just because it's in the book doesn't mean it's the best thing to spray. It'll have an effectiveness, and so you'll have to make a decision based on uh, what chemicals you have uh, in your arsenal and what species you're trying to spray. So uh, that might be something that you're interested in, and that's available on our AgriLife bookstore website. Um, you can just print it off if you have your computer hooked up to a printer. Uh, Brush Busters is also a really great uh, series that was created long before me. Um, they're done for each individual species of the most popular brush and weed species. Um, so each one's going to tell you exactly what to spray, what to mix, when to spray, kind of simplifies the whole herbicide um, quandary, but it's really only designed for individual plant treatments. So this isn't for a broadcast spray. One little trick I like to use when I do any type of outdoor work, um, you know, the, the, it's really hard to make plans because it seems like our weather changes daily. But I really need to make plans because if I'm going to spray, I live near the coast, we have really high winds, and we really want to make sure that we're um, spraying under the safest conditions and we've picked the best time to do it. And so I like to go to um, the NOAA weather forecast. And if you type in NOAA weather, this one's for Dallas-Fort Worth. There's one for San Antonio-Austin, or you can Google NOAA weather Corpus Christi, NOAA weather Brownsville, whatever's closest to where you are. And then, then click on the, they all look the same. You'll click on Activity Planner over on the left-hand side. And then you'll be able to put in what temperature you're looking for, wind speed, surface direction, um, precipitation potential. So if I was going to spray, um, I would not want to spray if it was over 90 degrees because you have a heightened chance of those chemicals volatilizing. Also, you never spray if it's over 10 miles per hour for the wind. And I usually put a precipitation potential of 0 to 15 um, because sometimes if they say we have a 15% chance of rain, it just really never happens. So I uh, give myself the benefit of the doubt. And then you're going to click on your map wherever, whatever dot is closest to your property. Um, and then they're going to give you for the next week when all of those conditions line up, the, the colors will all line up. Um, so you can get a really quick outlook of what days or times of the day might be good for spraying. Typically it doesn't look like this when I'm trying to spray. It'll be more like uh, a small window in the early morning that I might be able to get away with it. So real quick, I wanted to touch on weeds while I had y'all. Weeds are made to be pioneers of degraded or disturbed landscapes. And so if we have a lot of weeds, we have to take a step back and think about uh, why we have these plants that are maybe not desirable, depending on what our um, our goals for our property are, um, because they're made for a purpose. They hold the soil, especially annual weeds that come up early in the year. And it typically comes up when we have more bare ground. So a lot of people tell me that some weed took over their pasture overnight. But in fact, they usually look like this. Would you consider this a weed? Definitely not. If you're a wildlife person, some uh, forbs are really beneficial. But by May, they start growing a little bit more, and then August. And then by September, people start getting concerned and start calling me. And this is actually common broomweed. So it can be a really great plant, but if it's taken over your entire pasture, it may not be desirable depending on your goals. But if you notice in the middle of this picture, there's actually some T-post, and that's an exclosure cage. And inside of that exclosure cage, you don't see any of this common broomweed. And so the only thing different that's happened to this property is outside of the cage, we actually um, had grazing, and inside we did not. And so you can tell that overgrazing has contributed to this uh, plethora of weeds on this property. And so a lot of times if you're having weed or brush issues, take a step back and think about what management um, practices you're conducting on your property that may be actually contributing to your issue. 
For instance, when you have good soil coverage, you don't often see many weeds. But as you start to open up more bare ground, those weeds really take hold. And so the more bare ground, the more weeds. So it's a pretty simple formula. And that's because seeds, uh, either brush seeds or uh, forb seeds, they actually need a number of things in order to germinate. And so over here on the left-hand side, that's actually a soil depiction. That really big blue section is a mineral, so sand, silt, or clay, kind of how we refer to soils. That really small maroon piece is organic matter, which is small but really important. And then over on the left-hand side is air and water. And of course, that's going to vary depending on the environmental conditions and also what type of soil you have. But when we get rainfall, and then we combine that with warmth in the spring, and we get sunlight on bare ground, that's when seeds tend to germinate more often. So seed strategy is to produce a lot of seeds, especially annuals. You know, they, um, when I get calls, oftentimes they've already seeded out, so they've already done their due for the year. Um, but that's what they are made to do. And they can sit in the soil for quite a long time. So for example, common broomweed that we saw in that picture, it can stay dormant but still viable for germination for 15 years. Uh, woolly distaff thistle for 19 years. And just as a comparison, a lot of our brush species are not nearly as long. And ash juniper, which is probably, or blueberry juniper, which is probably the only non respratter I can think of right off the top of my head, um, that's 15 to 18 months. Um, so they don't stay viable for long. So if you're having a brush issue, it's sort of a short term deal uh, that you need to figure out how to get control of. Annuals are what we see usually first in the season, and that's why if we want to encourage forb growth, we often disc or open up bare ground uh, late winter. So first thing in the spring, we get a, a huge influx of these annual weeds. So again, consider your livestock grazing. There are things that you're conducting on your property perhaps contributing to things that you consider an issue. Remember, when if you do have livestock, we allocate our forage differently than we did in the past. So the old rule was take half, leave half. And now we think more like leave half, because that stubble that you leave is extremely important for root health. Uh, but insects and trampling probably account for 25% 20, of the forage that you see on your property. And so really, that only leaves 25% for your livestock. Here's an example of what I'm talking about for root health. So once roots get grazed, they, they trigger that they need to regrow more shoots or leaves. And that's fine. That's what our grazing grasses were designed to do. But over time, cattle or other livestock, they're going to target those better grasses first. And so as they keep grazing and coming back and grazing again, that plant keeps putting its resources to growing more grass, and they're not putting their resources where? down to the roots, right? And so your roots suffer. And so then as soon as we do get rain, uh, your really short roots are not going to be able to reach very far into that subsoil moisture and take advantage of it. And so either your place responds more slowly than your neighbors, or some of those grasses actually die, like in the case of when we had drought. So uh, making sure we take good care of our plants and prepare for the next year will help us situate ourselves so that we'll have less uh, weed issues if that's something we're trying to reduce. So remember, there's a lot of mechanical options. This is an example of how you might disc to encourage early forb, or forb growth for wildlife in uh, early spring. But if desirable weeds is not your thing, if you don't want forbs, then try to eliminate the amount of bare ground that you have. And of course, there's chemical options for spraying weeds too, but I like to first decide why we have those there in the first place. So when we spray broadcast, either um, for brush or weeds, make sure you know your plant and that you've read the label and that it's labeled for your plant. Um, that's one, because it's an environmentally smart thing to do. But second, you're wasting your money if it's, it's not labeled for that plant on the label. Um, it's best to treat weeds when they're six inches tall or less. So once they've already um, flowered and put their seeds out, there's really no reason to treat them. If you feel like you might get more forage growth later, you could actually mow the, the forbs. But treating them with herbicide at that point is uh, pretty fruitless. 
Make sure you maintain good pressure, and that's 20 to 30 PSI, and put out as much water as you can with that chemical so that you get good coverage because the actual rate of chemical in that entire mix is usually not very high. So make sure you're getting that water mixed with it and put over um, your acre evenly. So we suggest not going below 10 uh, gallons per acre, but if possible, try to do more like 30, uh, 20 to 30 and calibrate your equipment. So if you're measuring how much herbicide you put into mixtures, but you have no idea how much your broadcast machinery is putting out, um, it's really no good. So you want to make sure you know what you're putting out in the back end. The AgriLife Bookstore is where you can find a lot of our materials that I covered today, plus a whole lot more. If you just put in, in the search box, whatever topic you're interested in, quail management or whatever it happens to be, um, everything related to that will pop up. And if it has an E in front of it, it is an electronic version, and you could actually print that out. Um, otherwise, you can order those from the bookstore, and they're, they're pretty speedy. But that's agrilifebookstore.org. I want to cover a couple of plants really quick in our last few minutes. One is honey mesquite. That's one of the most popular things, and this happens to be the time of year that you would treat honey mesquite. Um, honey mesquite, or mesquite, is native. It's a warm season perennial legume. Um, it's found throughout Texas, and it's really uh, fair grazing for wildlife and livestock. The beans can be toxic if they're consumed in a high amount, but that rarely happens in nature. Um, that would be more like an artificial thing, like if you trapped a bunch of livestock with nothing else to eat in a trap. Um, they might actually find some toxicity from it. Um, in general, mesquite's good for mast and browse and some protection, and it's also a nitrogen fixer, so it's going to uh, add more nitrogen to the soil around it, which often helps other mixed brush species to grow up around it, um, and eventually you might even see them choke out that, that center mesquite, but it adds diversity to our landscapes for other plants that are not nitrogen fixers, so mesquite has a lot of great uses. Um, when it's first coming up, it really doesn't look like a mesquite until it starts to put on its true leaves. At first, it just has these cotyledon leaves, which don't necessarily resemble our true mesquite. Um, if you do have too much mesquite or you're wanting to kind of um, sculpt that mesquite into certain moths for maybe di different wildlife species. Uh, remember that it is a re-sprouter. You want to spray when the leaves are a dark green color. So after we get rainfall, we typically see some lime green color like we do early in the spring. And that's not the best time to spray because those plants are still trying to grow. And so they're putting their resources out. And remember, we want to tag our chemical along with it when they're putting their resources down to the roots. And again, you could do a leaf spray, we suggest Sendero, which is a non-restricted herbicide, at 1% for individual plant treatments. But you could also do a stem spray or a cut stump spray um, on selected trees. Wesatch, I don't know how many of you um, are blessed to have Wesatch in your area, and I say that with tongue in cheek. Um, Wesatch grows extremely quickly. It seems to take over areas, especially um, in clayier soils. Um, it's found kind of along the south and eastern portions of our state. Um, it is a native. A lot of people think that Wesatch was introduced, but it's native to our area. We just didn't have it in the same density that we do today. It's also a legume, although it's debated as to whether or not it adds as much nitrogen as our honey mesquite does. It's really not very valuable for wildlife or livestock. Um, but it could offer some protection because it does have a, a paired thorn uh, that can be pretty gnarly if you've ever run into it. Um, it too is a leaf sprouter. Um, it has very little leaf surface, but it has a lot of leaves, so it's really um, an interesting plant and kind of difficult to control. We suggest Grazon P plus D or Gunslinger at 1%, and those are restricted herbicides for Wesatch. Uh, but a lot of new stuff's being looked at, so hopefully we have some more options in the near future. Um, Wesatch we spray in the fall, so now is not the right time to be spraying Wesatch. This time of year is more like mesquite and mixed brush. Um, so keep that in mind that we're talking more like October. Uh, to be spraying this, but you could go ahead and do a stem spray or a cut stump spray um, any time of year. 
We think that we such is highly related to soil moisture. So it just seems like times when we have more soil moisture, we have better control of the plant years when it's dry. We just don't have good control. So um, judging by all the rains we're receiving, this fall may be the right time to take control of some of that wheatsatch. Finally, prickly pear, um, it's an interesting species that can really do um, best if you combine different treatments. So prescribed burning can help to control pear. Um, livestock love to come in right after a burn and eat pear. You can also burn and then apply herbicide afterwards or do herbicide alone. Um, when you spray pear, remember that the pads are like a modified leaf, so you need to spray both sides of the pads. So typically I'll spray one side and then just take a peek around on the other side and make sure I hit everything well. Um, you typically will spray an IPT treatment with surmount. You can use Tordon because they're both the chemical ingredient Picloram, but surmount's going to be a lot cheaper for individual plant treatment. Whereas when you go broadcast, either one's the same because you have to use more surmount. Um, still use a surfactant just like you were doing a leaf spray, and you'll spray all the pads to wet. And it's best to spray before an effective, uh, an expected rainfall because it helps to move that chemical in the plant a little bit better. Um, but really, uh, pear is a very slow thing to die. A lot of times I'll spray it, and I'll wonder if I even remembered to put an herbicide in. So keep that in mind, that it might be a couple of years before you see that pear actually start to turn and die. So here's surmount. It is restricted use. Um, it's fluoroxapir and picloram together. And that's what we suggest for individual plant treatments of prickly pear. And I'm going to skip over this just for time's sake. Um, but if you do not have a license and you're interested in treating prickly pear, you do have an option that's Vista XRT. Um, you'll put it out at just a 0.5% concentration, so not very much. And again, that's in water with a surfactant, just like you would do a leaf spray. So I want to remind you, um, I guess you do attend lots of webinars if you're doing this wonderful wildlife for lunch um, series. They're much older than us. They, they've been around for a while. A newer one is the Texas Range webinar series, and we also offer CEUs for pesticide applicators every other month, um, if any of you do have your license. Um, also, uh, it's the first Thursday at noon, so that's Texas Range webinar series, and you can check us out at that naturalresourcewebinars.tamu.edu if you're interested. And uh, we do have a Facebook page. So Mr. Pete Flores, he does a great job um, keeping up with our Facebook page. It's called Texas Range. And he tries to post just a couple of times a week, usually earlier in the week. Um, so like us if you're on Facebook, and you'll get access to that information. And he also publicizes all the webinars on there as well. So there's my email address in case you all have questions um, and need to go, because I know we're nearing 1 o'clock. But I'm going to hang around and answer all of them that are in the box. Um, are you there, Clint? Yes, I'm here, Megan. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. OK, great. Um, we had a couple questions come in. I encourage everybody that's left. We still have quite a few people here. Uh, Please submit your questions. We've we've still got some time to answer them. Uh, we'll jump right into the first one. A gentleman asks, what protection do you take when applying chemicals? They've been reading about how toxic many of these chemicals are, and some have been taken off the market. Do you have any organic type application for these plants? Um, no, sir. I actually don't have an organic type application, or I would definitely be using it. Um, my background is all in wildlife science, and as you probably could guess, we didn't talk a whole lot about herbicide use. And now it's a good portion of my job. And honestly, it's because of the type of species that we have in Texas that makes it more necessary, like we talked about, to use herbicides. But they can be a really great tool, but you do have to be careful. So um, all of our range and pasture herbicides, they're a little bit uh, less um, scary than, say, an insecticide, because an insecticide could work on us in the same way as an insect. But an herbicide works a little bit differently. Nonetheless, they're chemicals. So um, they say on the label, you must wear long sleeve shirt, long pants, closed toe shoes, and gloves when you handle the herbicide. Also remember, any time that you mix, that's when you're probably more likely to have splashing. And so I would suggest goggles. And I always wear a mask. 
Uh, in fact, I have some kind of asthma issues, and so I wear a respirator when I deal with herbicides. So it's really just whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, I often spray a long ways from our office because I do most of my research on private landowners' places. Um, and so I'll even go as far as to wear um, one of those white suits, but that's just so I can take it off immediately and drive home in clean clothes. So um, it's really just whatever you um, feel comfortable with, but it is required on the label that you're wearing a long sleeve shirt and long pants. Um, so definitely gloves, and I use nitrile gloves. So uh, great question. Uh, definitely protect yourself. I think we should do that no matter what we use. Just be careful because um, any type of chemical could actually wear on us, cleaners or anything. Okay, we've got some questions now on some specific plants. Uh, the first one, can you speak on white brush control? Oh man, white brush. Um, first of all, I'm sorry if you're dealing with white brush. Um, white brush is a really tough um, plant and really the only thing we have are kind of soil applied herbicides and they're not very selective. So if you have desirable trees near them, um, it's probably not going to be the best way to go. If you have just a few of them, it may be possible to do like a cut stump treatment um, or a stem spray treatment, depending on how many um, stems they already have. But white brush is just one of those. It's one of the more difficult uh, species for us. So I guess I should specify by soil applied. Um, I'm talking like uh, the hexanone uh, species which is going to be like your Velpar L, or pronoun power pellets. Okay, what about, uh, it says gummy lovegrass. Gummy lovegrass, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, if you want to email me, then I will find out, but that's not ringing a bell. Okay. Do you have another name for that, Clint? No, um, John, if you're still on, if you will if you know another name for the plant, uh, shoot me a message and, and we'll see if we can get it figured out. That's a new one on me. The, uh, the next question, can Tasahio be treated the same as prickly pear? Yes, great question. The exact same way you could spray it with uh, IPT with surmount or broadcast with Tordon 22K. Same way. Okay, the next gentleman says that he's considering removing cedars with the tree shear at ground level. Do you have an idea how many years it takes for the stumps to rot to the point that he can cultivate it? Okay, um, typically, I'm guessing you're in the hill country and you're talking about ash or blueberry and juniper. Um, you're lucky to have those since they don't re sprout. Usually, what I've noticed is that um, my trees start to break down by the second year. In fact, it's sometimes hard to find some of my plants um, because I do follow them for two years. And so I would give it at least a couple of years to know that that's broken down. Good question. Alternatively, if you're going to cultivate that, um, you could do something like a, a plow and that would take that out. But you're going to want to make sure um, you, know, you don't tear up your plow. Okay, it looks like that's all that we have for right now. Um, I'll give it just a few more minutes if anybody wants to send in any any additional questions. I'll remind everybody that our webinars are archived on our YouTube page and also on the TWA page. I'll get that, that link posted up for you all. That way you all have it. If you would like to go back and watch this webinar, give me a week or so to get it posted and I will, I'll have that up for everybody. Uh, if you'll stick around for just a second, I'll get it posted up after we shut down. Um, oh, looks like we missed a question. And I'm not seeing it. Uh, okay, Jose, if you'll repost your question, I did not see them. I apologize. While we're waiting on those, what is the best treatment for Roosevelt weed, Baccarus? Oh, Willow Baccarus. Let me look that up. I think we have a recommendation. 
No, we do not in here, but I know there are some. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do. One second. Willow Backris has a number of options, so I would encourage you to get that um, 1466 publication off the website. Um, if you're going to do individual plant treatments, it looks like you can do um, Weedar or Grazon P plus D or Weedmaster all at 1% or even just Remedy or Triclopyr at 1%. Um, so you do have a few different options there. OK. On the gummy love grass, the comment was that it's similar to windmill grass with a larger head, more tree shape that tumbles and piles up. OK. Um, what I can tell you about grasses is that they're tough because there's not very selective herbicides for grasses. So usually when you spray them, you're going to end up killing the other grasses that are around it. Um, and so I would just suggest a very uh, small spot treatment with glyphosate, uh, which is Roundup. Um, but remember, that's a broad spectrum herbicide, so it's going to kill everything. So you're going to want to direct it right onto those plants that you're trying to get rid of. OK. Uh, more specifics here. What chemical can be used for wetlands on cattails? Oh, man, I do not know wetlands, but there is an awesome website I would direct you to called Aquaplant. And that is good for both ID and chemical recommendations. Um, and that's Aquaplant, and it's a, it's a TAMU address, so A&M website. Sorry, I just deal with rangeland, so I'd, I would hate to tell you anything about um, water-related herbicides. OK. Uh, uh, can you comment on thinning out uh, cat claw acacia? Sure. So um, cat claw acacia is one that's typically not invasive, but if you are having invasive issues with it, um, there are some things you can do. Let me make sure I give you all of your options. Um, one thing, a lot of times when you have mixed brush, like the, I'm talking like a South Texas mixed brush um, in your fence lines, and you want to spray just one thing, one way to go is just surmount that 2%, of course, with their surfactant and water. Um, but for Cat claw clacia, you could do like a tordon and triclopyr or remedy mixture at just a half percent each, or a tordon and copyrolid, which used to be reclaimed, but now it's available as generic copyrolid at a half percent each. Um, and I will type those into the message box because I know that. While Megan's typing, I just posted the link of texas-wildlife.org slash webinars that you'll be able to use to go back and, and re-watch this webinar if you would like to. Also, we will have our next webinar is going to be the third Thursday of July. It's going to cover endangered species on your land. It's going to address what does this mean for you, good, bad, or indifferent. Did we hit them all? Uh, I think we have a couple. Cockleburr was one. Cockleburr, that is, oh, I see Russian thistle too. So thistles and cockleburr are kind of put together. Um, and you could use a um, Grazon P plus D at a 1% rate. Or if you're spraying broadcast, you could do 16 to 24 ounces. But Read your label and make sure that you're using the right amount um, for the job. OK, and then one last one I think we had, which uh, can be a big one, is salt cedar. Salt cedar. So I'm kind of lucky I don't have a whole lot of that in my area. Um, 
Let me make sure I tell you all your options. We did do a trial down on the river um, near Laredo, and it, it we could effectively control it, so that's a, a good thing. So you have a couple of options in our uh, book. One is Amazapir. I don't know if y'all are familiar with Amazapir. Um, but that's the chemical ingredient that's in arsenal or habitat. Habitat's more labeled for water areas. Um, Amazapir at 1% as an IPT treatment has a very high control. Or you could do it broadcast at 64 ounces per acre. Um, so that's what I would suggest. You could also do like the um, stem treatments if you only had a few, but more than likely if you've got a salt cedar issue, you've got quite a bit. So either 1% for IPT or 64 ounces per acre for broadcast. And that's, um, let me type that in, and that is a peer. And those are labeled, um, that chemical is going to be called arsenal or habitat. <clears throat> all right, I think that wraps us up, Megan. I really appreciate all the info. Uh, for those of y'all who are still with us, thanks for hanging on. I'm going to leave this slide up so you can copy down Megan's information if you did not get it already. Uh, I'll remind you that the webinars are archived, so you can go back and view those. And if you scroll up just a little bit in the chat window, you'll see that link there, there in the window. So. I appreciate your time, Megan. Great information, um, and we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.